Good to see everybody. So we, uh, how many people were here last Sunday, the main service? All right. Uh, okay, cool. So it looks like a lot probably weren't here then. And um, on a, we have the YouTube channel, the Tabernacle YouTube channel, and the sermons almost always get uploaded there unless there's some kind of technical problem. That one's for sure on there. And it was Pastor Jason that preached. He only covered two verses. We're in the uh, Gospel of Mark right now. And those two verses were uh, very powerful. So please go on there and, and watch last Sunday's service if you weren't here. But last week we saw that he covered the account of Jesus in the wilderness where he came face to face, Jesus did, with the enemy who was trying to tempt him to do all sorts of things that were dishonoring to his father. And in each instance, Jesus combated that temptation with the word, the word of God. And Pastor Jason's point was that the word of God is our weapon and that we desperately need the truth of God's word. So today, um, I want to take today to talk about our relationship with the Bible. And this is something that I've always wanted to do, and I think it's so appropriate given last Sunday's message. So we're not going to be in the Gospel of Mark, but it is an extension of our study in the Gospel of Mark. And each one of us of the four pastors, you know, you can identify something about each one of us that we seem to be most passionate about. Like with me, a lot of you would say evangelism, that I tend to tie in evangelism to a lot of the, the messages, you know, the need to go out and share the gospel. With Pastor Scott, it probably would be prophecy, end times, things like that. For Pastor Dan, uh, definitely faith, uh, integrity. He even has a business named after that. Uh, for Pastor Jason, unity, uh, brotherly love, things like, I mean, you can kind of get that. You, you, you see those weaved through a lot of the, the messages. And I am thankful to be known to be passionate about evangelism, but to be totally honest, this topic about hungering and delighting in the Word of God, I am way more passionate about that topic, honestly, than I am about evangelism. And the reason why is because if you get this topic, if you get this truth, then it will lead you to go share the gospel. It will lead to all the other things that are so critical in the Christian life. If you miss this, then forget about evangelism. Without this, you just simply won't be useful to the master or happy in the Lord. And so this is something I was telling my wife that I feel like today this message uh, is the most important message I'm not saying it's the best message I've ever preached, but I mean, I hope it is, but it's the most important message. I even, I even asked Aaron, please make sure there's a backup so it doesn't get deleted, because I haven't thought about doing Facebook Live. It's so important. I don't want it to get deleted, um, because you just have to have this. You have to, you have, to have this. Um, I remember when I was 14, my great-grandma, who is with the Lord now, my grandma Burton, godly, wonderful woman, she gave me a Bible. It's not this one, but for my, my birthday. And I already grew up in the church, and I already knew, I already read parts of the Bible, and I knew all the stories, Daniel and Abraham and David. And, but she gave it to me, and I just thought, at that time, I hated God. I had wanted nothing to do with God. I blamed him for all the things in my life. Two brothers with disabilities, one who can't walk or talk or f even eat food on his own, a mom that abandoned us, and a broken home. And I just looked at all of that, and I just blamed God for it. But she gave me this Bible, and I, I thought, well, I'll just read it out of respect for her. I, I love her, and I, I'm just going to start reading it. And I started in Genesis, and I just began to read one or two, maybe three chapters a day. I didn't understand a lot of it when I came to very difficult confusing passages, and I didn't know about commentaries and all the stuff that we have. To, I didn't really know about that stuff. I wasn't even a Christian. So much of what I would read would just be like a head-scratcher. 
But then certain things did make sense. And over the course of a few months, roughly, the Lord began to do something inside of my heart. And those words that are just ink on a page became living words of life that, that inside of my heart, it just sp- sprung up to eternal life. And one day, under such a heavy conviction of sin, I cried out to God to forgive me. It was through the word that I was led to Christ. It wasn't really a person. I mean, my grandma, my great-grandma, my grandpa were big impacts, but it was just simply the Bible that led me to Christ. And that might be the, the answer, uh, the similar story for you. Even if it was a coworker or a friend that God used, but ultimately it was the scriptures. They shared with you the word of God, and it led to you coming to Christ. And from the moment that I was saved, that was 16 years ago, from the moment I was saved, one of the most unmistakable things is that I knew that God called me to preach the word. Not just like to talk to people, but I, I knew that he had put a call on my life to preach, to be a preacher. And it was so funny because the Bible, I've shared it before, but the Bible used to be so boring to me before I was a Christian that when my parents would ground me, my dad took grounding very seriously and took it to like an extreme it basically what it would be is you're grounded for two weeks, which means when you're not at school, you sit in your bedroom in a chair in the middle of the room. You can't have any of your toys, electronics, nothing. You just sit in this chair. And if I come into that room and I find you doing anything but sitting in that chair, you're getting a beating. But there's one thing you can do. In that chair, you can either read the collection of the encyclopedia from A to Z, or you can read the Bible. And I would always choose the encyclopedia <laughs> because the Bible was so boring so boring. And I learned a lot of stuff about nothing (laughs) as a result of my grounding. But all of a sudden, now that I was a Christian, I longed to preach the Word. And doing this right now, this morning, is the most invigorating thing. Like, I love preaching, you know, the Word, because I love the Word. And I've had enough conversations with people here and outside of here, even this past week, to know because things get mentioned in conversation, to know that not everybody has the same relationship with the Bible that we really should have. Not everybody has what you would call a transforming daily time in God's Word. In fact, maybe that's a rarity that your Bible reading, maybe it is daily, but maybe you wouldn't call it like transforming. And so that, that's what this message you know, today is for. Before we go any further, let's just pray and ask the Lord to really speak to us. So Lord, we do come before you this morning, and we thank you for letting us open up your word and to hear from you. Lord, if you don't speak, Holy Spirit, then the words, they might mean something for a little bit, but we'll just forget it, just like James talks about. We'll just forget it, forget what we just looked at, and it just won't change us. But Holy Spirit, if you speak this morning, if you speak through me, if you illuminate the word, if you cause it to burn in our hearts, then we will forever be changed. And conflicts will be gone, and discouragement will be gone, disappointment, boredom will be gone. We won't need to go to certain things to find our fulfillment, because we'll just have it in you, and in, in your word. So speak, please, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I I want you just to, as we begin, I want you to see how precious the Word of God is in the Word of God. Within these pages, I just want you to see how precious it is. So I'm going to give you a sampling. Don't turn to these. You'll be spending all morning going through these. I'm going to read to you like 30 verses. Not really. Uh, Now, there certainly are 30 verses that you could look at. I'm just going to give you a sampling of some of my favorite ones because I just want you to, at the forefront, to see how precious the Bible says the Bible is. So Deuteronomy 8.3, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus also quoted that. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law, the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Uh, Psalm 12.6, 
The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Proverbs 35, 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. Uh, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand for a few years. Oh, I'm sorry. Will stand forever. I was making sure you're listening. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Job 23, 12. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. In other words, the word. There's synonymous, you know, terms for the Bible. I have treasured the words of his, uh, of his mouth more than my portion of food. Mark, or sorry, Matthew 7, 24, Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. John 17, 17, when Jesus prayed, which is really what the Lord's Prayer is, not what we usually think of the Lord's Prayer. This was the Lord's Prayer. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word, Father, is truth. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written in former days, which would be the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope, lacking hope. The Bible is your source. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, and we thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. Romans 10, 17 um, oh, I think I re already read that one. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I've got more. I'm not going to keep going. You get the point. I will go with just these couple last ones. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter, not just in the Psalms, but in the whole Bible. It's 176 verses. That's a very long chapter. And we're going to study the whole thing this morning. No. <laughs> No, but I do want to just point out four or five verses from, from that chapter. Verse 11, and we don't know who the psalmist was. Some, a lot of people believe it was David. But the psalmist said, I have, just listen to how much he loves the Bible. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Uh, verse 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. And lastly, verse 160, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Someone really quick, name a number. It doesn't matter what number between 1 and 176. Just someone shout out a number. 12. What? 12? Someone said 12? Okay, watch this. I, I have not looked at verse 12, but I can almost promise you that when I turn to Psalm 119, and I look at verse 12, it's going to have something to do with the Bible. It's going to reference the Bible in some way. If I'm wrong, I'm leaving. Because uh, there are a couple of verses that doesn't work in. But let's see, verse 12. <laughs> Boom. Verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. That's another word for the, the Bible. In fact, when you read Psalm 119, he uses a lot of words of the Bible. Precepts, statutes, uh, commands, your, your words your laws. Those, it's just the Bible, the Bible. So even a random verse that someone called out shows in that chapter, the beloved, this, this Bible treasuring chapter, how precious um, the Word of God was to this psalmist. Now I just want to look at two uh, passages in the Word and see uh, some things from those passages. So Psalm 1 would be the first one. Psalm 1, you can turn there. I love that this is the very first psalm. It's the opening to the entire collection of psalms, which, you know, the psalms are 
prayers and worship. So this is the, the beginning. I think it's there for a reason as the beginning. It sets the tone for all of the Psalms. And let's just piece it apart and see what we can learn. So Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. There's a whole world of people living in rebellion to their creator. A whole world surrounding us and surrounding this psalmist that live their lives in absolute rebellion, in sin. They sit, they stand in sin, they walk in sin, and then the final stage, almost as if he's painting a picture, they sit. They just get so comfortable. It's like they're no longer just kind of flirting with it, but they just sit there and live in it. And he's saying here, blessed is the man, happy is the man who doesn't live like that who doesn't uh, uh, dwell among a people like that. Yeah, they live in the same world as those people, but that world that they live in is not their world. That is, they don't sit in sin. They don't walk in sin. Because the contrast, his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight, his satisfaction, his joy, his pleasure is in the law of the Lord, is in the Bible. So what that means is that this man or this woman, because apply it to you, their satisfaction in the Bible is what's keeping them from living in sin. Or to put it another way, the Word of God keeps you from sin. Or to make it so pointed from what Pastor Jason shared last Sunday from Mark's gospel about the temptation account with Jesus, the Word of God is his weapon against temptation. And that's why he doesn't walk or stand or sit with the sinners because he's got a weapon in his hand and that weapon is a sword of the spirit, mighty, powerful, sharper, uh, two-edged sword, sharper than any human instrument or weapon that he pulls out and he looks at those promises, he looks at those warnings and he just says, "I, I treasure what you say, God, and I, I take delight in what you say. I take delight in you, period. And so therefore, I don't want to have, to, I don't want to take part in this over here. And I'm going to fight with the sword. That's what is keeping him from being like the, the wicked. Um, and it's not just a weapon, by the way. It's a world of wonder. Because notice it says, um, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. A weapon doesn't cause you to, you know, meditate. A weapon is just a weapon. You're fighting with it. So it's a lot more than a weapon to him. The Bible to him is a world of wonder. It is just such a satisfactory, what if that's a word, joyful, pleasurable, beautiful world that is opened to him. Is that how you would describe your relationship with the Bible? When you sit with the Lord in the morning or in the afternoon or in the evening, whenever you have your Bible reading, on, don't, don't raise your hand, but just answer it inside. Is, is that honestly, honestly, is that how you would describe your relationship with the Bible? Would you say like it is a world of wonder? Like you just can't wait to, to meet with him and, and it just, you're, all your joy is there? I think that a lot of us probably would not be able to say that. We'd say we love the Bible, but I don't know that we'd be able to say that it's like as precious to us as it, as it was here to the psalmist. And if it is, if it really is, it will be evidenced by this, that you meditate on it day and night, like it says here. He meditated on it day and night. And we're going to come back to that. That's a very important point. But I just want to point out just the part about the day and night. It's just continuous. It's not like my Bible time is from 7 to 8 a.m. So in that time, yes, I will meditate. After that, I got stuff to do. It's all the time. I'm, I'm in the middle of the night, I'm going to wake up and just think about the Bible and just meditate on the Bible. And look at the fruit 
of this kind of a relationship with the Bible. Verse 3, here's the fruit of it. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. When the word of God is your greatest delight and your meditation and you just are transformed by it, you become deeply, deeply fruitful. Your roots go down so deep uh, into the, the Bible, which is like a river of life, and it gets your soul so nourished. And so you're fruitful, not just outwardly for other people to see, like they can see maturity, they can see humility, they can see joy. Those things come from the Bible. But it's inwardly too. You're fruitful inside. You're full of joy. You just feel so satisfied with the Lord. That's the result. And not just fruitful, but you're also durable. Because look, he says, um, its leaf does not wither. So there's seasons when dry, drought comes. There's seasons when fire and heat comes, the dumb Florida summers. But that comes spiritually. That comes to our lives. And when your relationship with the Bible is rich and and it's a, a book that's precious to you. It's God's holy, beautiful, precious, wonderful word. You're durable. You last. Uh, an example from Jeremiah in chapter 17, he uses the same kind of illustration about the tree. And he says, bl Jeremiah says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green. It's durable, and it, he is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. But look at the contrast, verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So, the ungodly, the, the unsaved, they will perish. But it doesn't just mean them. Those who don't esteem the word of God will, if you are a genuine believer and, and you're, you know, you're actually born again, I mean, you're secure in the Lord's hand, but your relationship with the Bible isn't what it should be, yeah, you're not going to wither uh, in the sense of like losing your salvation, but man, you will spiritually wither. You will dry up. You will be grumpy as all anyone in the world. You will become uh, the, the most uh, conflict-centered person. You'll become the most uh, selfish person, even as a believer, because you don't, you're not being nourished. You're, you're, you're like dying. You're so thirsty. You're so hungry. Now, move your, your pages forward a couple pages to Psalm 19. If you have a little pocket Bible, just turn one page over since they fit like 10, page, 10 chapters on one page. So Psalm 19. Now listen to this. Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And in them, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. So David is just saying, he's pointing out to the night sky, the stars, He's pointing out to the daytime sky, and he's pointing out to this brilliant ball of fire that we call the sun. And he's just saying, man, look at these different things, and look at how every single day, without fail, no matter what part of the world you're in, they are constantly declaring the glory of God. When you look at that sky and you see the, the vivid colors of the sunset and you see the ball of fire rising up from the, the ground, it looks like, and all of a sudden the temperature is getting hotter and the, the, the green is able to grow, the trees, because of the warmth of the sun and the plants are growing and we feel better and we're not freezing to death and we're, then we're watching it go down and the beautiful colors and we can just smell the fresh air and we look at the trees and the birds. It all declares how beautiful and how wonderful and how glorious 
the creator is, how powerful he is that he didn't just create it, but that he sustains it, that he's the one who keeps winding it up each day. Come back, son. Come back from China. Back over here. All right, back down to China. Okay, come back over. He's, he's daily just bringing it out. And so, the, so David is saying, man, creation has a really loud voice. But then all of a sudden, in the next verse, he says, but you know what? There's something that has a much louder voice than creation. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. The word of God, that's, that's the law of the Lord. Yeah, creation speaks really well. It declares God's glory really well, but not even close to how wonderfully the Bible declares the glory of God. Yeah, spend some time here looking at the sun and the sky and the stars and just marvel at God's beauty, but spend so much more time here and marvel. Look what he says. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord, these are all different ways to to describe the Bible, is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Now, just notice, he sa- look at what he says the word is in these verses. So starting at verse 7, uh, and you can just look through your Bible. Look what he says, uh, what the word is. Perfect, sure, and your translation might have a different word, but uh, right, the word is pure, it's clean, it's true, it's righteous, it's desirous, it's sweet, and it warns. And then also notice, what he says the word of God does. That would be the next part of that verse. Look through it. It revives the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. It endures forever. Um, It's, um, let's see, Uh, it warns, it satisfies, and that's the reference to it being sweet, and ultimately it it has a great reward. It rewards. The word of God is so powerful. And look at the effect that it has on a life. Verse 12, in particular on David's life. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous or willful sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The effect that it has on his life is it it so declares God's glory. It so declares God's beauty. It so declares God's character that it reveals to him, man, I don't measure up. And I am not like this God that it's revealing. And the effect it's having on me is I want to be like my God. I want to be acceptable. I want to be pleasing to my God. And so that's what leads him to pray. Lord, show me the hidden sins, the things I don't even realize I'm doing. And Lord, show me the willful sins, the things I know I'm doing, but I do them anyways. Show them to me. I want to get those out in the open. I want to repent of them. And Lord, ultimately, I want the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing to you. How did he arrive to that place? What airplane did he take to land in that airport of wanting to be holy? The Bible. That's what brought him there, the Word of God. And it, that's the effect it has on us. So we've seen from Psalm 1 and from Psalm 19, and there's so many more we could go to, but we've seen a couple things. Number one, we've seen that the Word of God is precious. So much so that the psalmist would say, it is my delight. You don't call something your delight unless it's precious to you. You don't take delight in something that's not precious to you. If you don't like basketball, I don't care for, I don't care for sports really. So I have no delight in the Sunday football. I have no delight in certain teams. I, if you invite me over and you're going to be watching a football game, uh, and if there's going to be chicken wings, we'll be there. But I, I'll take delight in that. But sitting there watching the game, I am not taking delight in it. It's not precious to me. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just you're wrong. But, no, I'm just kidding. 
But it just, it's not precious to me. But if you're going to invite me over for coffee, and you're going to be creating some different types of coffee, some pour over, some French press, some espresso, oh, it's precious to me. We will both be there, and I will take great delight in it. I promise you. Well, that's the same thing. When it's something's precious to you, 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 you're joyful in it. You're happy in it. You, you devote time to it. Uh, and, and when it comes to coffee uh, and when it comes to football, it's totally okay if you don't like coffee. I, I mean, it's really odd, but it's totally okay. And then when it comes to sports, it's totally okay if you love sports or if you don't love sports. But when it comes to the Bible, if it's not precious to you, it's not okay because it will lead to your destruction. It will lead to your destruction. Also, we saw from these two Psalms that the Bible not just precious, but it's nourishing. You saw what it did in his life. It made him be like a tree planted by streams of water. Not, not just a tree, but a tree planted by water. Like that's as fruitful as you can get. That's the best place you can get is right next to the water. It's going to nourish you and make you green, uh, inwardly and outwardly. And then we saw precious, nourishing. We also saw that it's powerful. We saw Psalm 19. It listed all the things that the Word does. And I don't think that's all the things the Word does, but those are the things that David was most reflecting on, these beautiful things that the Word of God does. Now, just for a moment, think about the implications of that. If you don't treasure the Bible, if you don't have a transforming uh, time in God's word each day, then here's the implication. Your joy is hindered. Your joy in the Lord, it flows from that stream of the Bible. It will be cut off. It will be hindered. You're much more susceptible to sin. That's an obvious one because you're not prepared for temptation. You're not like David or the psalmist who said, I've, I've hidden your word in my heart so I won't sin against you. Because you're not doing that. The word is not that precious to you. Your fruitfulness, your growth, your maturity, it's stunted. Like you're not growing like you should be growing. Like Paul had to tell certain people, you should be moving on from this by now. I, I should be feeding you steak and you're still eating the, you know, the milk. Your life, first of all, you can just stop praying for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because your life will not experience the power of the Holy Spirit if you don't treasure God's word and delight in God's word, you will lack the wisdom that you need for decisions and navigating problems and conflicts and all these things. You'll, the wisdom isn't there. And you will not be in the will of God. How, how can you be in the will of God if, you don't, if you're not in the word of God? That's a good quote. Write that down. <laughs> to be in the will of God. I, I've been trying to think of quotes lately. I've been trying to post them as, I, as, I, as the Lord puts them in my heart. I'm going to write that one down. I like that one. You can't be in the will of God if you're not in the word of God. Someone write that down so I don't forget it, please. Um, you just simply won't. You won't know what God's will is if you're not in his word. And to, in short, just to summarize it, the most sweeping statement of all of it, you just won't be happy. I mean, is, doesn't everyone care about their happiness? That's why you do certain things. You want to be happy. You go on vacations. You eat foods. You drink drinks. You... I mean, we, we want to be happy, and that's okay if it's in the Lord and, and the things that he gives us to enjoy. If our relationship with the Bible is not strong, we won't be happy. So what I want to do is I want to take a turn and get very practical. And this is what I've always wanted to do because you hear this, these words here, and, and you're able to draw things out of it, but maybe if you don't see it more practically, maybe it will be hard for you to put it, you know, into play in your own time with God's Word. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to share a couple things, and if you take notes, please write these down. Uh, I just think it's very important because you're not going to remember it if you don't, you know, have a good memory or you take some kind of note. There's a couple things you're going to need if you're going to have a transformed Bible reading time each day. There's a couple things you're going to need. Uh, the first thing you're going to need is you're going to need a plan, okay? Now, uh, if you don't have a plan for how you're going to approach Bible reading, here's what's going to happen. You're just going to float all over the place. You're going to skip all around. 
you're going to use the verse of the day app or whatever. You're going to be here in this one psalm because it just, you know, it sounds like a good psalm for today. But then next week you're going to be over here. And what's going to happen is you're never going to camp out somewhere and really understand the context, really mine the gold, and really be transformed. Because you're never getting deeper than like an inch in any given passage. So you need to have some kind of a plan. Everyone has different personalities, and so that will be different for different people. Some people prefer as their plan for how they're going to do the Bible, read the Bible, they read it cover to cover. And so they'll start Genesis 1, and they'll read 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, chapters a day. Tomorrow, I'm going to pick up where I left off yesterday. Now I'm on Genesis 5, 6, 7, 8. The next day, blah, 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 and, and so on. Other people prefer to have some Old Testament, some New Testament. So it's maybe Genesis 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2. The next day, Genesis 3 and 4, Matthew 3 and 4. So you have a weaving of the New and Old Testament. Other people find a Bible reading plan super helpful. If you don't know what that is, there's many online. Basically, they're just plans that are created for specific goals. For example, um, getting through the Bible in a year, or getting through the Bible and the Psalms twice, or, you know, something like that in a certain amount of time, those can be helpful. It'll basically say, you know, today's January, what is it, 19th, today's reading is, and it tells you what the chapters are. Maybe you find that helpful. There's no real wrong, everyone's different, you know, and and what you choose is just going to simply be different. For me, what I prefer is none of those. What I prefer, I'm just saying for me, for me, what I prefer is to be in one book. I choose one book of the Bible right now. Well, Ephesians, but really Hebrews right now. And so I will not leave Hebrews until I'm done, until I've mined all the gold that I can this time around. When I'm done with Hebrews, then I move on. Uh, and so that's, that for me, for years and years, has been a very helpful thing. But that's not necessarily for you. So you, that's what I'm saying. You've got to come up with a plan. What's going to best suit your learning and comprehension when it comes to Bible reading? And maybe there's one that I didn't even mention. Maybe there's a whole other uh, approach to Bible reading. Um, but don't jump all over the place. That's, that's the key. So that's number one. You need a plan, okay? Determine what that's going to be for you if you don't have one already in place, okay? Number two, you're going to need a time. A time. And again, that's up to your circumstances and your personal, the way your life works, okay? We're all different. Not everyone has jobs. Not everyone has families, so maybe you just, the mornings are very hard for you. Maybe you find that you just can't do it till the evening. Uh, If that's the way that really works for you, then then do that. Although I will say, I strongly encourage the morning. At least try it out. The reason why is you're about to enter into a devil-ruled world, and that day ahead of you is going to be filled with conflict, filled with temptation, filled with discouragement. You can count on it. And you want to be prepared for it. And I remember John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, and uh, just an amazing man of God. One thing he said was, he who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him the rest of the day. Now, I'm not saying if you don't read the Bible in the morning, that means you're running from God. But just take it. If the shoe fits, wear it. So <laughs> Psalm 63, David said, early will I seek thee. So I think it is important to have it in the morning. But choose your time. And that time that you choose... For your time in God's word, here's the next thing that goes with that. You have got to protect that time. And by that, I mean, like, if you're, if you're going to have to do it, then just do it. Turn off your phone. Or put it on, if you have an iPhone, you can do do not disturb. I use that a lot because it, it basically silences texts, notifications, calls. It just kind of goes to your voicemail. And you won't know until after you're done, when you turn it off to do not disturb, you can see what you missed. Trust me, it can all wait. If it's really an emergency, someone calls you three times, it actually patches through and gets to you. So that's kind of a neat little setting. Uh, Protect the time. I promise if you decide, okay, my time in God's word hasn't been very consistent. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to start in the mornings meeting with the Lord. I promise you that tomorrow morning, a million distractions are going to be waiting for you. The washing machine's going to break, and you're going to want to fix it in the morning. And not any other time, but just the morning. Uh, the dishes, all of a sudden, are going to look a lot bigger than they really are. I've got to do those now, even though this is my only chance before the kids wake up. Just, you've got to protect the time. Give the Word of God the priority that it should have. For David, for the psalmist, 
it was so uh, of such a priority that they meditated on God's word day and night, that they treasured God's word. They found great delight. So make it um, so, so protected. Uh, and then thirdly, and this is the one that I, I just don't hardly ever hear anybody talk about, you need a strategy. Now, as soon as I said that, I guarantee that some of you thought, a strategy, why would you need a strategy? You just read. Like, what, what kind of strategy is there to read? Oh, I will absolutely say that there is a strategy when it comes to effective, transforming Bible reading, and that reading is like only one of the things you're doing. And maybe that's your problem if you felt like your time in God's Word is a little bit dry. That might be the problem. Maybe you've limited it only to reading because that is only one part of our strategy to really meeting with the Lord. So there might be more. The things that stood out to me, there's five of them. And I'm going to have them on the screen as we go along. The first one is read. Let me make sure. Uh, that's a given. I mean, obviously you're going to read, but let me just clarify what I mean. Not read a devotional. Now, those have their place. If you want to read that later on in the morning or, or, you know, sometime in the day, it's like some dessert, you know. But that's not your Bible reading. That's not your meeting with the Lord. If that is the extent of your, of your meeting with God uh, each day, then you got to put that to the side for a little bit and get to the Word. Get to the source. Get to the river. So read God's Word. Not listen to a sermon. Oh, there's great sermons to listen to, great pastors, great teachings, but just... That will have it. That has its place. The Word. Read the Word. Um, <clears throat> reading requires a little bit of groundwork. Like, you know, effective reading. It requires a little bit of groundwork. So one thing is, you want to recognize who the author is and who the audience is. And don't say God. I know God is the author. But God used men over a period of time in different continents. There's a reason for that. He used individual people. He carried the lo them along by his Holy Spirit and had them write down exactly what was on his heart. But there were certain authors that were, and the books were written to certain audiences. So you got to ask yourself, you got to kind of get to that. Like, what am I reading? Who wrote this? Who is he writing to? So when you are reading 2 Timothy and you start to realize, oh, we just, you know, studied this recently. Paul wrote this. Oh, he wrote it from prison. Oh, these were his last words. These were his final words. And he's writing to a young pastor who's timid, who's afraid, who is about to kind of, in a sense, you know, step into Paul's shoes in some ways. And he's trying to encourage him to fan that flame. Don't be scared. Be bold. Do you see how much more precious that book will be to you now, now that you've answered the question, who is the author and who is the audience? It also protects you from taking things out of context. So when you're reading Jeremiah, and you come to Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You don't take that verse and say, yes, God wrote that just for me, and now I know I'm going to get that job. Because God promised I'm not going to be harmed. I know that I'm not going to face tragedy now. I, nothing but blessings. Money, money, money. <laughs> now, that's an extreme example. I don't think anybody really takes it that far. But we do things like that. But if you, re if you ask the question, well, who's the author? Well, the author, well, that was God speaking. But the author of that book was Jeremiah. And what was Jeremiah doing? What was that particular verse about? God was letting his people know that uh, Judah, the people of Judah, that they're going to go into a 70-year captivity, that they're not going to be prospering. It's not going to be like that. But take heart because you will. I'm going to bring you out of it. I'm going to bring you out of it. And while you're there, you can hold on to this hope. That totally transforms that verse. So that's the groundwork I'm talking about. You have to figure out who the author is and who the audience is. Now, um, if you don't know how to do that, if you're very new to the Bible, you know, you can just look online. Uh, look for an introduction to Philippians, and it'll tell you. You might even have a study Bible that will give you that, so you can kind of understand who it is. Okay, that's, that's read, okay? Next one is consider. Consider it. Think deeply upon. 
Now let me give you an example. This is some information about the moon, okay? So our large natural, natural satellite always presents the same face to the Earth because it completes one orbit of Earth in about the same span of time it takes to complete one rotation. The dark planes on the side facing Earth are volcanic features called seas or maria. The first human landing on the moon took place on the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, surface conditions, uh, the temperature is, ranges from negative 280 degrees at night to over, like, you know, positive 260 degrees, so it's hotter than Florida. And uh, there's a, some information about some of the core. The solid iron core is in the middle, the partly melted outer core. Uh, the moon is about 2,159 miles in diameter. It's about a quarter that of Earth. And astronaut James Irwin uh, on the moon is pictured there. He was from Apollo 15, which was August of 1971. So, all right, we're done. No, if in a few hours from now, maybe, let's say it's maybe tomorrow, I were to say, hey, I heard that you guys learned a little bit about the moon. What was the... Um, the volcanic things called on the moon. Okay, some of you got it. All right, all right, show-offs. <laughs> what, uh, what was the temperature again, the temperature range? I know, it's very fresh. I know it's very fresh. <laughs> and what was the guy's name, that, that uh, something, Ir- Irwin? Uh, and, and what about the diameter? What was, the, it was, what was it, a certain? Right now, you might remember it. But... In a little while, you're not going to remember unless, because all you've done is just read. That's all you did was read. But if you consider what you just read, it will stick with you. So if you have an interest in the moon, that's your delight. You love lunar, uh, you know, studies. Uh, That doesn't mean you're loony. You love lunar studies. Then those facts, what you'll do is you'll do more than read them. You'll consider them. You'll think deeply upon them. And like James talks about, you're not going to look away from the mirror and forget what you've been seen, what you've uh, been shown, things about yourself, things about God. You're not going to forget because you've considered. So to consider, it, when you do that, it prevents truth from going in one ear and out the other. How many times have you read God's Word and then your spouse or someone will say, hey, how was your time in the Word or how's your time lately been? What would you read? What's God been showing you? And you're like, it was good. Uh, I can't remember, honestly. That, that's happened to all of us because I think sometimes we fail to really consider. Um, when Jesus said to love the Lord your God, he said do it with all your heart, with all your soul, strength. What was the other one? With all your mind. With all your mind. So when you deeply consider the things that you're reading, you're loving God with your mind. You're exercising your mind in love to God to consider what he has said. Second Timothy, when Paul wrote there to, to Timothy, uh, he said, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy, the things that I'm saying to you, which is scripture, don't just read it. I want you to think. Go a step further. Think over what I say. The Lord will give you understanding. Think. And, and that, that involves asking questions. You know, what did, what did he mean by that? Okay, and, and so if he meant that, then what does that mean for me? Wow, what does that say? What are the implications of that? And you can start to think, I remember this other scripture. Let me go there for a second. Wow, I see the connection there. I wonder if maybe he was thinking about what he said already. And you begin to draw these connections, and the Bible begins to come to life as you consider what you're reading. The next one, is meditate. Now that sounds like it's the same thing because you're just using your mind, but I I, I think of it as a step further. And I just want to clarify for one second. We often hear about meditation in today's world, like the modern meditation. It's that new age practice where basically you're emptying your mind. Biblical meditation is you're filling your mind with God. You're filling your mind with truth. Okay, so just want to just clarify so you don't take meditation as this um and trying to, you know, get your mind empty. It's exactly the opposite. So this is similar to considering, you know, asking those questions, thinking deeply upon. But the difference here is 
you're just letting it marinate in your heart and mind. You're letting it, you're, you're trying to get all the flavor out of it. You're trying to get every last bit of juice out of what you just read. And I remember someone saying that the Hebrew word for meditate is the same word that we get when we describe the way a cow chews hay or grass or whatever. And the idea is that when they chew it, they're chewing forever. Like, oh, oh, oh. I mean, it's taken forever before they finally swallow it, before they finally digest it. And the point is, you're taking a very long time to get the Word of God just so uh, absorbed in your heart and mind as you digest it so that it, it comes to life, so that it means things to you. To read the God's Word without meditating on it is to consume truth without enjoying it, without delighting in it. And that's why we have the verse, Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly because you meditate. And it comes to life. I want you to see how critical this aspect of Bible reading was to men of God that, that you and I look up to from the past. Charles Spurgeon, he said, Some people like to read so many chapters every day. I would not dissuade them from the practice, but I would rather lay my soul a soak in half a dozen verses all day than I would, as it were, rinse my hand in several chapters. Oh, to be bathed in a text of Scripture and to let it be sucked up in your very soul till it saturates your heart. Isn't that totally different than just reading a chapter? George Mueller, these are, these, the men I'm quoting are my heroes. These are men that I love and respect and read their books and read history on them. Men that I, that I, I trust. I, I see their example. He was uh, a pastor, a missionary, an orphanage, uh, like a, uh, what would you call that, a, the founder of orphanages in England. He said, now, as he was learning about Bible reading, he said, now I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditation on it, that thus my heart might be comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, instructed, and that thus, while meditating, my heart might be brought into the ex experiential communion with the Lord communion with the Lord. He also said, it often astonishes me that I did not see the importance of meditation upon Scripture earlier in my Christian life. As the outward man is not fit for work for any length of time unless he eats, so it is with the inner man. What is the food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the Word of God. Not the simple reading of the Word of God so that it only passes through our minds, just as water runs through a pipe. No, we must consider what we read, ponder over it, and apply it to our hearts. Thomas Watson, one of the Puritans from the 1800s, he said, the reason we come away so cold from reading the Word is because we do not warm ourselves at the fire of meditation. And last one, William Bates, another Puritan, from the 1600s, I, I think I might have said 1800s, I meant 1600s. He said, the great reason why our prayers are ineffectual is because we do not meditate before them. Meditation, soaking in, thinking deeply upon, getting all the flavor out of what we just read is such a crucial step. We saw it in Psalm 1. He meditates on it day and night. We saw it in Joshua 1 when God gave that instruction to Joshua. Don't let the book of this law depart from you. Meditate on it day and night. Same exact command. Now let's go to the, the next one which follows from meditation, which is pray. Pray. Pray the word of God. There, there is no better prayer to pray than the very word of God. There is no better word or better way to pray. So if you ever struggle like, well, I don't know if I'm praying kind of selfishly and I just don't know if this prayer is really right. Well, you can be sure, you can be, just rest assured, if you're going to pray the Bible, then you're going to be safe. You're on safe ground to pray the word of God. You've, as you think deeply upon what you just read, as you meditate on it and just soak up the flavor of truth, you turn that into prayer. You begin to ask God for what you just read, what was just revealed to you. R.A. Torrey, uh, one of D.L. Moody's closest friends, a, a pastor and an evangelist, 
um, in the same time as, as Moody, he said, prayer that is born of meditation upon the word of God is the prayer that soars upward most easily to God's listening ears. It won't be hindered because it's pure. And George Whitfield, a famous evangelist, if you know of him, he said, I began to read the Holy Scriptures upon my knees. This proved meat indeed and drink indeed to my soul. I daily received fresh light and power from above. When you take God's word and you just begin to pray it, you, so when I've been praying for someone and I send them a text or I call them to encourage them, the times when it really has meant the most to them, when they've said, wow, like you have no idea the timing of you saying that, the times when that's happened, it's always been the times when I had been reading in the word I thought deeply upon it. I meditated on it. I turned it into prayer. And as a result, I felt something. I need to send that to my brother. And then he responds, that, that was so meaningful to me. Because that, that's, it's life-giving prayer. And the last one um, is revisit. The reason why I say revisit is because your daily Bible reading time is not just that one time in the morning. If you want to be transformed, you just keep coming back to it all day. So when I read in the morning, I'm very fortunate to work at a place that's located on a lake, and I have the freedom to take walks around the lake uh, a couple times a day. And so in the morning I go, and in the afternoon I go. And I can be out for 15, 20 minutes. And so I'll go out there, and I'll walk around the lake, and I'll have my pocket Bible or my phone, and I'll go back exactly to what I read in the morning, just a couple hours before. And I'm reading it over again. And I'm re-thinking about it. I'm re-meditating. I'm re-praying. And there's new things, because you can never get to the bottom of God's Word. It's a well that never runs dry. It's a mine that you'll never get all the gold out of. You'll always find new gold when you excavate the Bible. Um, and like I mentioned from Paul and Colossians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If, you're, if it's going to dwell in you richly, you're, you keep going back to it. Now, I don't have it up here, but I, I do want to add one more. And, and it's not maybe, yeah, I'm just going to add it. It's memorize. I personally believe that me memorization is so important to um, having transformed Bible reading. And I don't mean memorize a verse. I mean memorize a book. Memorize a chapter. Memorize passages. What we do often is we memorize like a life verse. Like, I love Galatians, you know, 1-9. I love Philippians 4, whatever. That's my verse. And that's great. And do that because you want to have it tucked away. But remember that Philippians 4, 13 came from Philippians 4, which came from Philippians. So it's even better to memorize passages. I, I, try to, I do try to memorize books, and I'm working on Ephesians right now, and I've, I've got a lot of it down. And I'm telling you what, when you do that, it comes to life in a way that you never, ever experienced before. Now, I've heard people say, well, I don't memorize because it'll make, I'm, I might fall into pride. Because the Pharisees memorized Scripture, and Jesus rebuked them. Well, here's a little, little gentle reminder. You're already prideful. I'm already prideful, okay? You're not going to become prideful. You already are, okay? Is there a danger that you might turn that into something? Yes, of course. And you have to be careful. You've got to check your motives. Uh, you're not going to just walk around and uh, quote Scripture because you want to sound spiritual. That, yeah, that's obvious. But don't let that stop you from memorizing God's Word. Now, some people will say, well, I don't have a, a very good memory. Really? Then how come you can quote all those song lyrics of those secular songs? <laughs> how come you know every line to Elf, the movie Elf? You don't have a very good memory. You have the whole script memorized. Our memories are far better than we say that they are. And it just takes discipline, just like anything else. Uh, someone maybe not, isn't very good at basketball until they start dribbling and practicing, and then they just get better. So your mind grows, and there's nothing wrong with being disciplined and really engaging your mind, memorizing Scripture. But just remember, memorizing Scripture should be after this stuff. 
You don't want to memorize scripture without having considered it deeply, meditated upon it, gotten the flavor out of it, turned it into prayer, gone back to it, and now you're memorizing it. If you memorize it without doing this, it just doesn't really do you any good. You'll be like a Pharisee that just simply has scripture quoted, uh, uh, memorized. So, and a funny thing Charles Spurgeon said, the Bible in the memory is better than the Bible in the bookcase. That is truth. It's better. Don't you want to be prepared so that when someone comes to you and they say, I'm struggling with this, I don't know what to do, that instead of being like, oh, I got to get Google out. What was that verse? It was like, um, I can't remember. Instead, you're able to say, brother, let me share something with you. And it's there because you've tucked it away. You've hidden God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. By the way, when the psalmist said, uh, I meditate on your, your word day and night, or when God spoke to Joshua, meditate on it day and night, um, did they have this Bible? No. They didn't have the, the, the physical copy of God's word in the way that we do. Like in certain periods of time, there was like a scroll or, or a letter written to the churches that they would share. So they had to memorize the Word of God, if they're going to meditate on the Word of God day and night. How are you going to mem- meditate on it at nighttime when the scroll is at the church down the street? You have to have it in your memory. So that's just one thing I would add as, as, a, as another uh, bonus. Okay. Now, we're wrapping it up. What was that verse? When I, when, was it verse 12 someone called out from Psalm 119? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's put it into practice. So Psalm 119, verse 12. Let's do this with this verse. So just open up to Psalm 119. Now, let's do verse 12 and 13, because 12 is so short. So we'll do do 12 and 13. So let's read it first. So blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. We'll do 14 as well. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much in all riches. All right, so we read it. That was good. Now, we don't want to make the mistake of ending our time there, which is what we, I think, sometimes do, which is why we miss out. So the next thing, let's consider it. Now, for me, my mind is too small. So what I have to do is I have to only do one thought at a time, one phrase at a time. I can't consider all of that at once. So when I'm doing it, I look at this. Blessed are you, O Lord. That's it. Okay, blessed are you, O Lord. I'm going to consider that for a second. Blessed, I know that that's like another word for like praise, like praise the Lord. And this psalmist, I know David, or I know a psalmist wrote this. I know a little bit about the Psalms. It's a book of prayer. It's a book of worship. Okay, very fitting that he would say, blessed are you, O Lord. And I just imagine he's, he, he says, O Lord. I, I can just think, blessed are you, O Lord. Like he's just... You know, he's in love. He loves this God. Blessed are you, O Lord. Okay, now I'm going to meditate on it. What is that? Like, what can I gather from this? Like, how, how, what, what can I draw out of this? Well, God, you are always worthy to be blessed. You are always worthy to be worshipped. Whether I feel like it or not, whether my life is in shambles or it's great, you are always worthy to be blessed. Okay, how can I pray? Lord, Blessed are you, O Lord. Praise you, Lord. You know, I'm not even feeling it this morning, Lord, but I, but I know that you are so wonderful. I just bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, next thought. Teach me your statutes. Okay, let me think about that. Statutes, I know, is another word for, you know, the Bible, for commandments, for just basically God's word. Okay, teach me your statutes. Teach me. Okay, so I need to be taught Things don't just come by osmosis. I don't just read and I just get it. I need to be taught. Okay, that reminds me of how Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. That reminds me how the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Okay, let me meditate on that for a second. I need to be taught by you so that I can be transformed. If I'm not taught by you, I'm not going to be changed. I'm just going to be the same person. God, you, 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 the one who I just blessed, who I just praised, Lord, Will you please teach me your word? Will you please teach me your way? I don't want to just read this. I want to be changed by you. Next verse. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. 
With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. So the psalmist is speaking out loud God's word. So it's so meaningful to him that he doesn't just quickly gaze over it. He just, he says it out loud. He declares it. He thinks upon it. Okay, Lord, I'm going to read this out loud. I'm going to read everything that I, that I come across this morning and in a way like the psalmist did. Like, I'm just declaring it. This is God's word. I believe it. I cling to it. What can I draw from that? Now I'm going to turn that into prayer. Lord, help me to declare your word. Help me to take joy in your word. In, and then verse 14, in the way of your, and I'm rushing, but in the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Interestingly enough, this is something I read yesterday, not this verse, but one just like it. And as I was doing this very practice, the Lord showed me something. He says, um, I delight in your word uh, more than I delight in riches. What do riches do for a person? What does money do for a person? It opens up the world to them. When you've got money, now you can travel. Now you can go eat at the, the nice steakhouse. Now you can um, do, buy a new house. Uh, buy four houses if you want. Uh, get a new car. This car is old. I'm going to get a new car. Like, if you have money, the world is opened up to you. And the psalmist here, as you're going through this verse, you realize, wow, he's saying, you know, money might do that for a person, but the Bible opens up God to me. And that's why it's more valuable. That, and so that statement I just shared with you, that came to me as a result of reading. It was from Psalm 19 yesterday. Reading it, considering it, meditating on it, turning it into prayer. And then all of a sudden it just struck me. I was actually walking around the neighborhood when this happened. It struck me. Wow, Lord. That's why the psalmist would say that your word is more valuable than riches. That's a hard statement. Riches are really valuable. I mean, I, I like money. The money can get you, know, get you things. It's hard to survive without money. It's hard to be able to do things without money. It's really easy to be stressed when you have a shortage of money. But he's saying here that, like, I, I have more delight in, in your word because it opens up you to me, Lord. And that's what money cannot do. So I rushed through that. Um, I would take a lot more time if this was just me. Uh, personally, but you see how you can do that. You read it, you consider it, you meditate upon it, you turn it into prayer, and you just keep going back to it throughout the day. And it will come to life in your heart in ways that you've never seen before. And just as I close, a couple more just practical tips. Uh, take it or leave it if this works for you. I recommend writing things down. Uh, a lot of us are learners that way. If that's how you learn by writing, if that's how you remember, then get a notebook. You can get one for cheap at Walmart, you know, or, or if you type. My grandpa, when he has his time in the Word, he does it on his laptop. He reads the Bible on his laptop, and he types on his laptop every single day. Uh, and I look up to him so much, and I learn so much from my grandpa, his example of treasuring God's Word. So if you're a typer, if you're a writer, do it. Maybe you're a drawer. Draw it if that's what's going to help you. So that's one suggestion. Uh, another thing is, when you're reading and something isn't very clear, you're having a hard time understanding it, focus on the things that are clear. And those are going to help make that more clear. Don't just rush to a commentary. Just if, if you're tripping over it and you're not getting it, just keep reading, keep praying, keep meditating, and maybe the, the whole passage will interpret that one verse. I, I, God will do that. Um, another thing Know that there are going to be dry times, even when you do this. You're going to go through seasons where it's not going to be that you're on top of Mount Sinai and the Lord is like thundering down and speaking, or the Mount of Transfiguration, and you're beholding the glory of Jesus, and then you come out and you're radiating the light to your spouse. Sometimes you might just feel pretty dry. And so the word for that is you just got to press on. Do it by faith, not by feeling. For the most part, you're going to be enriched and you're going to feel, you will feel joy. You will feel the Lord's presence. But sometimes the Lord's going to let you have some dry times. You just keep pressing on. Another one, I totally recommend getting a study Bible. Those are very helpful. The, the notes in them can give you information about the book, about the author. Uh, if you want a particular recommendation, the ESV Study Bible is excellent. You can get it at, um, what's that store called? Uh, not Aldi, but um, 
Ollie's, O-L-L-I-E-S. There's one in St. Pete for $25. It's, that book is it's $90 originally. It's $25. It's a great study Bible or a different one. But find a study Bible if that's going to help you to be able to get facts and information about what you're reading. Another practical tip is to cross-reference other verses. Most Bibles, it will, at the very bottom or somewhere in the margin, most Bibles will show you like, hey, this verse that you just read, there's 15 other verses that are related to that. It's helpful to look those up and begin to tie the Word of God together. And then I would say, as a last resort, go to a commentary. As a last resort. They're not wrong. They're not wrong to go online and use some Bible study tools there. But that's someone else's work. That's someone else's meal. And it is a benefit to us. But don't skip your own meal in a rush to get to what he, this certain person already uncovered. Have your own meal first. Let the Lord speak to you. And if still you want to get more clarity or you just want to learn more about the passage, then maybe go to whoever, Albert Barnes or whoever, whatever commentary uh, you use. Make sure that they're, you know, Christians. Because um, you can get some interesting commentaries. Just because it says commentary, it, it might be a, you know commentary from the viewpoint of hell, so just be careful. Last thing as we close, and Drew and, and Dave can come back up. Um, Jesus spoke to the Laodicean church, and he, he told them at the end of his rebuke of them, remember they were the ones who were lukewarm, uh, they were the ones that he was given some pretty strong warnings to. At the end, he said, behold, listen up. That's what behold means. Listen up. Don't miss this. I stand at the door and knock. He is not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to the church. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. This morning, Jesus Christ, the King of glory, is knocking on the door of your heart if you're his child, and he is saying, hey, son, hey, daughter, I want to have dinner with you. I, I want to have breakfast with you. I want to just teach you things. I want you to be filled with me. And I'm watching you day after day approach my word so lightly and not taking it seriously and not going through these ways of absorbing what you're reading. And you're missing out. And so I'm speaking to you, my son or daughter, hear my voice, hear my knock. If you open up that door and if you start to read and consider and meditate and pray and revisit and memorize, I am going to eat with you. We're going to have sweet communion. And I'm going to close with this quote from David Brainerd, Brainerd uh, beloved missionary, amazing man to the Native Americans in the 1700s. If you ever read his journals, if you get a chance to read his journals, you can get it on Amazon for 3 or $4. You will weep as you read his journals. Uh, it makes you just feel so unworthy. I mean, just the, the devotion. But man, his love for the Lord and his love for the Word of God. He said, Lord, I will never come away from thee without thee. Make that your resolution. Lord, I will not leave this time reading your Bible today without walking away with more of you. I'm not leaving empty-handed. I resolve that I will not leave this Bible reading time without getting something from your word because you always have something to say. You promised that you were going to have dinner with me. We're going to have a meal. We're going to have communion. I'm not leaving until I walk out of here with something from you, something personal, something real, something from you. Now, if you do this, what's going to happen is you're still going to face the temptations that you face right now, and you're still going to face the conflicts, and you're still going to have those difficult situations or people with difficult personalities. They're still going to be in your life, but now when it comes, you're ready, and when that insult comes upon you, you're like, God bless you. You, not, maybe not those words, maybe you choose some different words. It's not like an old grandma, but, but you, you're going to respond with grace. You're going to have so much more maturity. 
You're going to have so much more wisdom now that you've got the word in you. So Father, we just come to you and, and we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful and beautiful and glorious word. And we pray that you would help us, Lord, to really get so much from your word than we do now. We pray that we would have meal times, communion with you, that we'd walk away transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word. Pray that you would resolve difficulties, uh, conflicts, uh, disagreements, uh, immaturity, uh, lesser desires that take up our, our desires for you. Lord, invade each one of those things. Address each one of those things by the yes. power of your Holy Spirit. We invite you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name.